Happy Easter, everybody. On this most blessed of days of the year. And uh, I'm John Barnwell here in the city of Detroit, the Straits. In Michigan, north of Detroit. And I'm here with the Archbishop Reverend David William Perry, who still bends down when he has the cloak laid across his shoulders, his broad shoulders. And uh, we're of the good fortune to have a, a man who has spent a lifetime of study in contemplation with the emphasis on moral theology, which is an interesting thing because as you know, uh, I have a tendency to speak regarding the work of Rudolf Steiner. And he, throughout his body of work, he speaks of three particular principles, the imagination, inspiration, and intuition. So that's your thinking, feeling, and will. That's in, in the Eastern system, the higher aspect of that being the Manas, which is the higher mind, the Buddhic principle, which is the higher realm of feeling, out of which compassion arises, and then the high, highest principle would be the Atman, and that's like the thing that's described so extensively in the works of Advaita Vedanta and other traditions in the East, Abhidhava Gupta and, and all of them. And, and in there is, is a uh, psychological or esoteric system of knowledge pertaining to the various principles that are possessed by a human being. But because of their relationship to a point in time, they don't have all the concepts necessary to come to understanding as to what this festival today represents. It's there in seed form, in, in the lore regarding Vishvakarman and the higher aspect of feelings is so strongly articulated by the Buddha, who is the teacher of the Eightfold Path, which pertains to the 13 or the 16 petaled lotus of the throat chakra. And in the brow, of course, is that manas, the two petaled lotus. And in the heart is the 12 petaled lotus of the heart. That's the Atman. That's, that's where you get to be the whole zodiac. And that's the image that we're working with because there are certain aspects of this mystery that, that require uh, a certain amount of participation in order for the individual to be able to unfold what is meant. Because as of late, I've been talking about enantiomorphism or enantiomorphic pairs, mirror images. And to take another look at that, you could say that the type of intellect that, that modern humanity uses, the uh, brain-bound, uh, materialistically inclined intellect that can only receive from the life of the senses its ideas and opinions about man, his destiny, why things happen and all that. And out of that is the remarkable development of science. But the logical extension of the scientific model leads us into a state of entropy. <laughs> That's where, well, okay, we got this, this energy dynamic happening and eventually it runs out of steam and just kind of caves in on itself. 
that's that's what they're saying and and just so you know and but there is that aspect of it but what we're looking at today or striving to look at i need to bring up something here because it was funny because i wanted to uh I wanted to uh, put some things, and I did put things beneath, but uh, I had to truncate them because I could only have 5,000 words and this extended it over, but it doesn't matter because I'm gonna share it with you right now. This is Rudolf Steiner, three lectures on Easter and Pentecost. This is the first lecture from March 27th, 1921. There's no uh, collected works number listed for it and i didn't feel like spending time to hunt that down so uh in any event it says the easter of the world will only come when a sufficient number of people feel that the spirit must rise again within western civilization outwardly this will find expression in that men will no longer wish to explore what is going to happen to them will not explore natural laws or the laws of past history, which are similar to natural laws, but they will have a great longing for knowledge of their own wills, of their own freedom. They will desire greatly to realize the nature of their own will, which can bear them beyond the gates of death, but which must be considered spiritually if it's to be perceived in its true form. We will never be able to grasp the true thought of Easter, unless we realize that in speaking of the Christ, we must look upwards from what is merely earthly to what is cosmic. Modern thought is made a corpse of the cosmos. Today, we look at the stars and calculate their courses. This means we calculate something about the corpse of the world. We do not see that life dwells in the stars and that in the courses of the stars the intentions of the cosmic spirit rule christ came down among men in order to unite the souls of men with the cosmic spirit only a true expounder of the gospel of christ points out that what we see in the physical sun is the outward expression of the spirit of our universe the resurrecting spirit of our universe <laughs> a little slow there. So, Reverend David, happy Easter, brother. A very happy Easter to you and yours, John, my friend, and, and to our viewers and listeners. He is risen. He is risen indeed, um, which I'll be saying again very shortly to all of my Orthodox friends, but we're all family, using slightly different calendars, but we're all family. Yeah, I mean, we, we've had our Easter Sunday lunch. Um, I was relaxing with my partner before this wonderful show. Um, and I've been looking forward to it very much. It wouldn't somehow have been the same if we hadn't spent some time together on Easter on Easter day. Um, I'm thinking of a couple of things at the moment, like the release of that... John? Well, of course, because, I mean, isn't today uh, the point of all the other... Uh, talks we've had. Oh, I mean, today is. You said of course, it, today is like the big day. I yeah. mean, Christmas, you know, is wonderful, yeah. but Easter is really the the promise of the future. Yeah, the final yeah. conquest of matter, the the rising again. I mean, uh, of Christos Sophia. I mean, if we're talking about my Gnostic neck of the woods, um, we always saw things as he and she at the same time we were ahead of it all all troops remember that it we came from us first um yeah i mean i don't i don't know i'm sort of worried about lapsing into preaching which i don't want to do on on the day of all days when the mystery of all mysteries is realized um i just want to yeah i just want to have the pastoral side of me just wants to wish a very very happy easter as i say and easter blessings and easter greetings i hope that one day Everyone involved in this project uh, will see Easter not simply as an external celebration of an idea, 
but actually be a preparation to Christ being reborn in our hearts, to Christ being born and then reborn in our hearts uh, as an actual energy, as an actual experience, not simply uh, as an ideology. Um, therefore, we're getting into mystical territory very, very quickly. Uh, certain Valentinianism, at the risk of being incredibly misunderstood, so go for it, David, there's no point holding back. Valentinians always tended to see the Old Testament as largely allegorical, um, as, as largely the work of myth in the best of all senses, uh, not as anything trivial at all, as core distilled human experience um, made sacred by its universality. So we've always, John, my friend, you're very active today. <laughs> Well, I recall that it, it in the description it says a conversation. <laughs> and so I thought, oh, that's interesting. Uh, yeah, well, in reference to what you're saying, there, there's that story uh, that I've re related on a few occasions to where uh, C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien, the author of Lord of the Rings, right? They're, they're taking a constitution, as they would say, in good old merry old England where David hails from, but taking a walk uh, in, a, in a wooded park, I believe. And they were discussing scripture and C.S. Lewis, of course, because of his role at Oxford University was, was an expert on certain periods of English history and literature and all of that just as J.R.R. Tolkien was uh, the Oxford don for uh, the early Old Sax Saxon and Old Saxon uh, languages, and the basis of the English language. And so they're taking a walk, and Lewis basically, and I'm paraphrasing, well, that's all well and good, you know, the, the, the myths of, of the Bible, and and all of that, you know, it's very it's very much a good thing. And Tolkien turns to him and says, "But it's true." Of course, if if the Old Testament is literally true in every way, we've got some severe moral problems, um, which can't just be pushed to the side. Um, and I'm hoping Valentinus, in all of his inspiration and enlightenment wasn't simply doing that obviously as a valentinian priest i i don't think he was doing that um uh, but yeah i mean you know uh, uh, we've tended to always think there were very different purposes and unfoldings certainly we take the new testament as historically true and gos uh, true as a gospel as a series of gospels so uh, i suppose our position is rather complex but as i said I'm trying to avoid all of that at the moment. Uh, yeah, C.S. Lewis and Tolkien, when you hit it yourself, professor of old English, all that heavyweight material, it comes out in the Lord of the Rings, all that heavyweight material. Whereas you get the light French touch with C.S. Lewis. Um, is it only me that sees that as a major innovation? The minute your bloody Anglo-Saxons start losing their grip and you get all that fine French pastry coming along. And better cooking, you know, and so you get a completely remade British society. We've nothing like it now. We've nothing like anything now, but that's a different question. I'm not getting maudlin on, on Easter Sunday. You did remind me of something, actually, which I was sort of was going to, to bring up a minute to go. I love our conversations, but I'm, I'm horrified, John. I'm horrified. Our faith was attacked again on Good Friday. By the release of the North, oh God, I didn't keep a straight face. By the release of the Northman, and I think it's a disgrace that Nicole Kidman can not only try and pretend that she's interested in Asser Truth, love you not, it's a career move, you're not interested in Asser Truth, and bloody Willem Dafoe as the village idiot, yeah, I can go with that one, I can go with that one. Um, and you know, you think it's Hamlet. It's Hamlet remade, and these people have been utterly shameless. Um, and I, I was saying to my partner, 
Oh my God, it's Gertrude. She's playing Gertrude. He's got to kill her at some point during the film. And surprise, surprise, he kills her later on. You even get bloody Yorick turning up. One of the shaman, one of the witches. Hang on, there's a difference there. But in this movie, they're interchangeable. One of the shaman is holding a skull, an irregular skull. And he puts it in the ground in front of him. No, you're meant to pick it up. You know, alas, poor Yorick. I knew him well, Horatio. And so it's shameless. And apparently, um, the guy, the name for the North, the Northman warrior, is meant to be the seed from which we get Hamlet. Oh my God, I hope not. I mean, what a morose bastard. You know, all right, so you've had a tough trot. You've had a very, very difficult beginning. We can all work that out, yeah. A king has killed a king. Nasty business, nasty business. Despite everything anyone can do, Nicole Kidman turns up. I mean, you know, oh, heaven, combing her hair like there's no tomorrow. That awful Bjork, what was it, uh, ice cube? No, no, sugar cubes? What was it? Oh, God, love, give it a rest. Go back to I Iceland and shut up. I couldn't stand your music in the first place. It's indulgent. It's, you can barely sing a note, darling. Go away. Right. Anyway, she turns up as one of the CRSs, or is she a witch? The movie hasn't got the idea at all that us are true and the heathen mob of old were very clear about the differences because they write about it at length, right? Tolkien writes about it. C.S. Lewis does not write about it because everything's moved on a lot. But, um, and she turns up saying censoriously to, to the hero, your brother took my eyes. And she, she's got these things over her eyes. Uh, very good cosy, very good piece of cosplay, very good cosy. Um, lovely feathers. You can't beat feathers on a stage. And he says, showing he's got no brain, I don't have a brother. <laughs> and he didn't take us. Well, if you don't have a brother, of course he didn't take her eyes, darling. You know. And right, she's speaking in an enchanted way. So maybe it's not meant to be taken literally. Oh, God. So, you know, the movie, just, and it trundles on until the final battle scene where everybody's naked. I don't quite remember that in any of the sagas. And um, there's this bloody Valkyrie that won't shut her mouth. You know, she turns up at the end after she's been prowling the territory and you see her riding up into the sky, approaching the great light that's beyond all things. That's not a heathen idea. That's Gnosticism. You know, so where did that come from? You know, the old transcendent light is not in any of the sagas and it's not in that way of thinking. Or is it? But there's a that's a different question. Um, so, but and I came away, re I didn't go to the cinema, don't worry, it was Good Friday, but we saw it the minute it was released because I, you can tell Nicole Kidman's got to be a baddie. What a cow, right? Have you ever played a nice girl, Nicole Kidman? Right, I'll say nothing else. So, I mean, you know, and it was the, the overacting, which I love. And it was the complete disrespect for European tradition, which you just get used to nowadays. And it was this shameless appeal for a couple of old actors to resuscitate their failing careers by trying to tie themselves on, to turn themselves into an, a rising neo-pagan religion. I mean, it was shameless from beginning to end. Um, it, it reminded me of that. Um, yeah, you know. Oh, yeah. Mo uh, moral theology. Do you know, I, I, I don't think I've had a single thing published in moral theology. Um, I've got lots of stuff. If anybody's interested, um, and it tends to be very modern. I mean, I remember I did my masters because I thought nowadays that's what I meant years back. I wouldn't wouldn't think it now. That's what a, a, a cleric. That's what a pastor should do. You should prepare yourself for the modern world. And it was my my supervisor, a, a, a man with a Zen-like grasp of what people should be doing and shouldn't be doing. Professor Bernard Hoos, great guy, great individual. Uh, and also he's got this weird way of working things out. I'd missed a seminar and he, uh, by, I can't remember what, and he put the thumbscrews on me to say, you're doing uh, the one on 
genetic engineering. You're doing the seminar that's coming up on genetics. And I go, oh, yeah, Bernard, what do I know about stuff like that? No, you're doing it. And I didn't feel I could seize back the moral high ground because I'd missed, missed the seminar. So I did it and felt you know, I was suddenly launched into this world I wasn't prepared for at all, which was genuinely intriguing. Um, papers, papers flying around. This is ages. This is years ago. So everything's been moved on furtively or not. Where Peter French, uh, one of the great uh, genetic theorists, geneticists of our time, um, was apparently in a conference with Bernard. He kept that bloody quiet. Bernard is one of the people that put moral theory into the necessities of explaining the human genome uh, project. He was one of the guys that implanted the fact it wouldn't make complete sense without some sort of moral framework. So he was kind of big gun. Um, and it was sort of a, a cross between a story he told me and what I was reading, where basically they were all gathered together. Uh, uh, now, if ever there was a bunch of witches, it's them. Um, and they were talking about soldiers of the future with the military throwing questions at them, like if you could have a green soldier for jungle combat. They're, apparently, they were all sat there nodding because they couldn't see the problem. And um, if you could have a soldier with big feet, maybe they all have big feet, uh, a big feet for jumping and what was it, jumping and landing. And they were looking at each other. And then they started nodding again. And I was like, God, this is appalling. And it got down to the fact that uh, people back in those days were planning not only how you could look at the, the gender of your baby well in advance. I mean, all this gender stuff, a lot of which is silly, uh, some of which is deeply profound uh, because the Human Genome Project has found all sorts of things no one expected, like male and female brains. No one expected that. You could be a very manly man with a female brain in your body, and that's just nature. And as far as I remember, I mean, yeah, so many years ago, John, but there was no explanation at all for that. You know, someone was saying something about heat. If your mum got hot at a certain point of pregnancy, you ended up a man instead of a girly. So I'm not, you know, oh my God, is it all down to hard boiled eggs and stuff like that? Um, anyway, um, so, you know, it gets awfully complex. And of course, as a society, we haven't really had time to digest it all, pun intended. Um, so because it takes time, you know, things of that complexity can't be just, you know, yeah, I, I've got an opinion, which is what everybody's doing at the minute, as opposed to thinking, what does it all mean? You know, where is it going to? Where is it coming from? So they were talking about things like that on the National Health Service, as we have in this country. You know, would it be ethical for the state, actually, we pay for that. What's the state got to do with it? There's no such thing as government money. It's our bloody money taken through taxes that's given to the government. Can, can they remember that, please? Um, anyway, that's called taxation. That's where they get their money from. So um, they were saying, should that be available on the NHS? And, you know, should poor people, what a loathsome phrase that is, should poor people... <laughs> Be allowed to to choose the gender, choose the gender of their of their of their young when it was still at a stage when it could be manipulated. I mean, God, what a thought! Um, and you know, maybe they could be you could abort a fetus by a given time. I don't know what I think about all of that. I've never sat down and thought about it. It's not one of my fields. Uh, I'm pro life to an extent, but not completely because there are all sorts of complications. You know, unwanted pregnancies sometimes are from very terrible circumstances. So I don't want to get into all that. Like just a moral minefield. Um, and, you know, it ended up with him saying, well, maybe you can alter your own genetic code. You know, so it was at that point I stopped my research and delivered the paper that was necessary um, to a, a standing ovation, actually. Um, which I only received, I think, because I was saying roughly what I said a minute ago. All of this needs to be digested. But, yeah, how long does it take? John, my friend, am I, am I harping on? Sorry. No, I just wanted to make sure everybody caught when you said to a standing ovation. <laughs> that, was, that was the good part. It's all the good part. But uh, that, that's an interesting point, that you got that kind of an effect. Well, I think it's good at a university that a clergyman can get that sort of 
the sort of effect. And yeah, I, I didn't say it for that reason. I said, I suppose, because they felt my conclusions had been worth worth arriving at. Like, you know, in terms of moral theology, curiously, this isn't um, one of the branches of moral theology I specialised in. Um, I find moral theology incredibly intoxicating because you're dealing with both sides of the brain. You know, you're dealing with the rational bit, but you're also dealing with emotions, instincts. Um, so, yeah, as a person, as an individual, I'm I, not, not saying anybody else should. I always found it intoxicating. And that's why it frustrates me that none of my stuff has ever been published. Um, yeah, because they, 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 were, they were worried at my concerns. And my concern was, was it Herbert Spencer? Um, in many ways, a very misunderstood man. I mean, he says some worrying things by our modern standards. But you've got to remember the time frame he's around in. Um, he's starting those questions. He's not finishing those questions. You know, I mean, he's sort of linked with eugenics, but at such an early stage, he's certainly linked in with the idea of genetic improvement. Um, but he doesn't seem to be one of the monsters of that, because maybe because it's too early. But he did say something along the lines that, you know, society must be given, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, a breathing space by which to be able to take this on board. And what does it mean? Um, and, you know, otherwise you end up with mock gladiatorial battles like uh, Darwin and the Darwinists against the church. I, I've never had any truck with any of that nonsense. You know, D the Darwins against the Huxleys. What you mean? Two very rich and rather informed families showing off in public. Um yeah, so Darwin, of course, it was a Unitarian, so you're not really dealing with an atheist. And the Huxleys, who, you know, both members, both families members of what they used to call the intellectual aristocracy, uh, rich liberal families that really did benefit the country beyond belief and poured fortunes into the infrastructure, which is more than the Crown's ever done. Yes, I did say that, even though it's Sunday, sorry. Um, you know, because they genuinely cared. Anyway, you know, battling it out in, in this mock gladiatorial battle, no time for it. You know, why didn't Darwin go to Ang the Anglican Church, the Church of England Church, with his wife on a Sunday? Because he was a bloody Unitarian. There we are. There's that one solved. Um, you know, the Darwins used to hold soirees. I mean, they, it's not only the Frenchies that do that. right? They used to hold intellectual soirees. Um, not just the immediate Darwins, the whole family, where, you know, modern Druids would turn up and and Sanskrit and the Upanishads would be read out. So they were quite a bohemian lot. And they were so, apparently one of Darwin's uncles, who was a cler uh, Unitarian clergy, actually read The Origin of Species from the pulpit and said what an amazing insight it was to start a new series of questions. That's more healthy. But, but um. I'll just say one last thing, and I promise I'll shut up. Yeah, no one's... I'm sorry, I don't do it for nothing. If someone wants to pay me to do a film review, I'll do it. I'm a poor clergyman, right? Um, and there's a lovely idea... Oh, I've got some things to say about Japanese cinema. But um, if someone's going to pay me, I'm tired of being so poor. I, I can only get one chalky egg this year. So for my kid brother... Anyway, right. So, um, uh, well, uh, yeah, so genetics... Uh, I was rather impressed by Herbert Spencer saying society needed time. It does need time. Otherwise, you end up, I, you know, I don't personally feel threatened by the ideological nonsense that's floating around at the minute. You know, him, she, they, and so on. Um, because in a society like ours, where everything's televised the moment it happens, you know, what else do we expect? But society will digest all of these incredible facts, the complexities of gender, how gender intersects with biological sexuality. I mean, it will digest it all. And we will have learned a great deal along the way. It's just our impatience and our, I don't know, our, our need for spectacle nowadays, um, which, is, which is sort of getting in the way of serious discussion. So between the Northmen... And that bloody Nicole Kidman um, and, and sort of a moral theology. Yeah, I'm having quite a fine 
uh, uh, Easter, John. How are you spending it yourself, he said, having seized too much time? Well, speak of the devil. Oh, did I say that? Just last night, uh, we were watching uh, a Nicole Kidman movie, and we got about a third of the way through it. She was playing uh, a sheriff who was a former FBI agent that got fired because of some bad event. But <laughs> the movie was so dark that we thought, well, what's the point of watching this? You know, it was like, so we shut it off and watched something else. But so, yeah, I hear you. There's this like desiccation of art is how I would describe it. They want to like suck the life out of it, you know, because ultimately those powers that, that want to rule over us hate Christ. I mean, that's the simplest way I can put it. So anything they can do to, to, however unconscious it may be, they may be don't even realize that that's their stand. It's just an urge in them. Uh, but ultimately, it goes back to coming to understand the events of this season. Yeah, Kidman's father, right. Exactly. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And of course, apple, uh, the Latin word for apple is melum, which means evil. So there we have it, because our Lord was, was crucified between a thief and a murderer. So you could see that the thief would be Lucifer, uh, the that which reflects the light and would love to like have human humanity follow behind in his trail where he forms a new uh, non-physical planet that we can all dwell in and be his servants. Or the murderer on the other side that in film was described, uh, whoops, David disappear between uh, the thief and the murderer. And so, of course, the murderer is Araman, or the satanic principle, the material principle. The murderer, uh, you can see that as, as being a reference to the, the slaying of thought on one level, because our experience of thinking until it becomes enlivened is of the nature that it's an image of, of what thinking really is, that, that thinking actually is something higher than what is taking place within our nervous system filter, so to speak. You could see it, that it constrains us to be able to cogn be cognizant of certain aspects of the world in which we live. But Rudolf Steiner points out in his philosophy of freedom that there is this higher level at which one can come into relationship to one's thinking. And that's a, a real key in the book, The Philosophy of Freedom. But the, the Easter path, I'm going to share another passage with you because David mentioned the Gnostic teachers and all of that, and they were the uh, writers that were the ones that put the emphasis on the Holy Sophia. And so here's a, here's a uh, passage of Rudolf Steiner's from Lecture 12 of the Gospel of John, uh, May 31st, 1908, in Collected Works, Volume 103. And the links, of course, are below for both of these lectures I'm referencing. But here, and I quote, this cleansed, purified astral body, which bears within it at the moment of illumination, none of the impure impressions of the physical world, but only the organs of perception of the spiritual world is called in esoteric Christianity, the pure, chaste, wise Virgin Sophia. By means of all that he receives during catharsis, the pupil cleanses and purifies his astral body so that it is transformed into the Virgin Sophia. And when the Virgin Sophia encounters the cosmic ego, 
the universal ego which causes illumination. The pupil is surrounded by light, spiritual light. This second power that approaches the Virgin Sophia is called in esoteric Christianity, is also so-called today, the Holy Spirit. Therefore, according to esoteric Christianity, it is correct to say that through his process of initiation, the Christian esotericist attains the perfection and cleansing of his astral body. He makes his astral body into the Virgin Sophia and is illuminated from above. If you wish, you may call it overshadowed by the Holy Spirit, by the cosmic universal ego. And a person thus illuminated who in other words, according to esoteric Christianity, has received the Holy Spirit into himself, speaks forwith in a different manner. How does he speak? When he speaks about Saturn, Sun, Moon, about the different members of the human being, about the processes of cosmic evolution, he is not expressing his own opinion. His views do not at all come into consideration. When such a person speaks about Saturn, it is Saturn itself that is speaking through him. When he speaks about the sun, the spiritual being of the sun speaks through him. He is the instrument. His personal ego has been eclipsed, which means that at such moments it has become impersonal. And it is the cosmic universal ego that is using his ego as its instrument through which to speak. Therefore, in true esoteric teaching, which proceeds from esoteric Christianity, one should not speak of views or opinions, for in the highest sense of the word, this is incorrect. There are no such things. And after something like that, it's hard to do more than just brace oneself, because in this, Rita Steiner reveals to you that the Gospel of John really is that doctrine that has been given forth out of this type of a consciousness. And that the, the Gospel of John, which is the meditation manual for the Rosicrucians, the true Rosicrucians, especially the first 14 verses, where in of the mystery of the incarnation of the Logos is thoroughly described, you see that what you have there, and also encoded within the Lord's Prayer, that you have this whole idea of what the end result is of the Easter experience. And so it's that redemption of thinking that's the first step on the path. And 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 but that comes through this again clarification. They're talking about the Divine Sophia, that's that, that wisdom. Sophia is wisdom. So we have wisdom, love, and will. A lot of people want to put love in the heart, but that's, that's well, that's another uh, episode. We'll do that one. Well, we could talk about that. But, and these things are not definitions. So again, you have to say, well, what do you mean by that? And it's very specific when you get into the descriptions that Rudolf Steiner gives of the two-petal lotus, the 16-petal lotus, and the 12-petal lotus. And in coming to an understanding of this, you see that this is the Western path. Like what he said in that first quote regarding the West, if the West was really going to unfold uh, a Christian uh, pathway, then it's necessary for, for certain events to take place. And what we're looking at is a description of this higher triad of, of chakras and that the, the chakras below that are pertaining to previous evolution, previous incarnations and all that, that you've already should have done uh, on that uh, part of your super sensible being. But now we're working on the consciousness pole rather than this vital pole, which is the, the, the lower chakras, so that you have this consciousness pole that we're here working with and in dealing with this within the consciousness soul, because the other name for the consciousness soul is the spiritual soul, as I've said on many events. And so what is that? Well, that 
spiritual soul has to do with the relationship between the consciousness soul when it begins to approach higher thinking then it comes into relationship to, which with the the uh, spirit self and this spirit self is is that or the the manas principle in theosophical parlance the higher mind aspect of it so that you have your your yourself and then you have your higher self but then see you have your your true ego which is above that and it's important to understand that these principles until we uh, have developed ourselves to a certain stage because all this is there in potentia it's potentially there you know the these chakras but they have to be orchestrated and that comes like what he's talking about here with the idea of catharsis that's where the ego actually is able to work into your astral body and bring about a purification a clarification and that is what brings about the unfoldment of the chakras within the astral and then the astral comes into the relationship with the etheric body the body of life which relates to the that the logos throat chakra and imprints and and then between the symmetry between the two of them is what arises the super sensible uh, faculties of perception uh, to go to go higher than that even is to go into that heart chakra and and be able to to perceive the whole chain of evolution from old saturn old sun old moon earth jupiter venus vulcan the whole sevenfold series so you have uh, a path here but this this path of coming into relationship to the holy spirit brings the light and see you have to make the distinction because you have light everybody thinks of light as coming towards them as like from the sun but the the ultimate goal and and what we were rescued from through the mystery of Golgotha was that this whole idea of, of entropy could have been, it could have been true. We were saved from entropy, so to speak, of collapsing in on ourselves. And that now we have to give birth ever so, so slowly to future suns, that, that the, the future of the radiance of Earth so that the earth becomes a sun rather than a planet, another planet, so to speak. It's moving in that direction through the, to the extent that humankind takes up the destiny of, of what has been shown them by our Lord Christ through the resurrection on Easter. Yes, I was, I was having a little interference with the transmission, do forgive me. Um, I'm not quite sure what was happening there, but everything's okay, I think. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, oh, gosh. Uh, yeah, I recall actually the Druids, uh, from what is known of their teachings, which is very little, um, used to talk about very similar things. Um, that the, the facts, again, paraphrasing, please forgive me, and I'm putting what they said in a modern vernacular, so that they wouldn't have said it quite this way, but what they were getting at was um, the most evolved beings in our system lived in the sun, um, and basically the earth itself was going to become a sun. Um, and the, I, was it the moon? I can't remember. Uh, that would become a planet at the moment. It was dead rock, but that would become a world in its own right. And we would become the sun to that world. I mean, certainly this is very deep esotericism. Um, and it's something even Gurdjieff um, flirted with. I mean, I'm not saying he did, didn't agree with it or did agree with it. I'm saying it comes up every now and again in his writings indirectly. Um, and you know, it's curious. I mean, he was Greek Orthodox. People tend to forget that. That bloody fez makes everybody think he's some sort of Muslim. And, you know, good good on your Muslims. You know, I had a fez. It was stolen. But that's a different story. Um, yeah, I mean, because he's wearing that bloody fez all the time, people forget he's actually Greek Orthodox. Um, so he, 
um, he, I mean, he was saying it. He was John. He's not a Shriner either. <laughs> Do you know? I love the Shriners. I love the Shriners. I they ride love... around in those little cars yeah. on parade. <laughs> Well, I want to be one of those little cars what they all drive into a convention hall wearing their fezzes. Um, I'd love to do that. I'd love to do that. Um, <laughs> um, oh, God, yes, yeah, your poor man's masons again, isn't it? You know, all these all these different permutations if you, if you can't afford to be a Freemason. Um, yeah, so there, there's all that going on. Very deep cosmology. No surprise to me at all that Anthroposophy discusses it, that Steiner discusses it. No surprise to me at all, because this is deep-rooted, core, true esotericism. Um, and, you know, so it makes me, this is where I get into trouble, it makes me uh, feel that basically Gnostics and Valentinus, as I've said repeatedly, and I'll keep saying, I suppose, is really a, a, a one-off. I mean, he shouldn't have been put on the prohibited list in the first place. Um, as I've said repeatedly, you know, if, you, if anyone had said to him in those days, are oh, you a Gnostic, he wouldn't have known what you were, what you meant, apart from the fact it was a word you attacked your enemies with. Uh, so none of them would. But, you know, he just said, no, he was a, a Catholic. He was a Roman Catholic. Um, so, you know, the fact that Gnostics are right in so many ways of not overvaluing history, you know, a, as an act of bodies in space and interactions in space. You know, okay, with a meaning towards what? Uh, and that's not to devalue the pursuit of history or the study of history and the vital role it plays in, in cultural unfoldment and understanding different cultures and even science itself. But I'm saying we've got to be careful. You know, if we're, if we're looking at religious materials, um, which is why the modern ancient alien brigade I mean, I'm not against them. It's just with so much of the material, they've got the wrong end of the stick. Religious books are talking about religious things. They're not badly written history books, and they're not inadequate technical manuals. They're simply not talking about those things, with one or two rare exceptions. Religious books talk about the internal journey and the discoveries of higher planes of consciousness and what we encounter. That's what religious books do. Um, so, you know, the fact that Gnostics take a rather snooty disdain towards history for its for its own sake. Actually, is important and explains why you know it shows that they're focused on something else. People should you know realize it that way, regard it that way. I mean, I was asked a, a years back to speak for Network Rail, uh, which is one of the big uh, train companies uh, in this in this country uh, they were they had a a burgeoning spiritual branch god where do people where do these companies get money to spend things like that i'm not moaning i got my expenses paid john did you get to wear one of those uh, engineer hats when you when you gave the talk <laughs> oh, no there was i mean they, i don't know they looked at me with absolute horror from the minute i arrived um, so, no, I mean, I, I got there early because I didn't realise the protocol was you had to be like Joan Collins. You know, you turn up five minutes before, smile at everybody, do what you do, then sod off. I didn't realise in those days that's what you had to do. Um, so I turned up early to try and get involved with everybody, muck in with everybody. And was greeted with looks of absolute horror from the minute I arrived. Um, had some sandwiches. Could have been nicer, could have been nice. You've got the money, you've got the budget. Had some sandwiches with my brother comrade on the on the rock face. John. Yes, these things are allowed, but not permitted. <laughs> yeah, but I didn't know you then. And I and I didn't, I was very I was much younger. So I, I thought, you know, it was all about you know, community in every sense of the word, but it's not, it's not. So, you know, you live and you learn, you live and you learn. Um, so I did me bitch and, and then realised I was expected to go. Um, and I, on, on the way out, one of the local ministers, one of the local pastors said to me something I'll never get over. Um, he was, he was, I think he was on that weekend. In other words, he was performing service. He was offering a service of worship. And it was it was something to do with when Eve ate the apple, 
and I, I I stared at him, and I didn't know what to say. You know what I what I wanted to say, but I was frightened I was being a bad guess anyway. Was you actually think a short fat woman ate a physical apple? Do you? What's wrong with apples? So that's what I was just just about to say, but realised I'd horrified everybody enough for one day and got to the door as quickly as I could to get my own train back to London. Um, you know, we've got to be careful of overvaluing those aspects of our experience which are valuable, but not transcendentally valuable. You know, the fact... I'm trying to think of an example which is as neutral as I can make it. You know, the fact that Elizabeth I liked a certain type of perfume as opposed to others. You know, is it really a philosophical and theological importance? No. Is it completely unimportant? No, I'm not saying that. But I am saying maybe it's something to do with, you know, the type of sociological and psychological history that has very clear boundaries. Um, and that's not, that, that's not really what theology and it's not what religious practice is all about. So my trouble with the ancient alien mob, to extend that, but where they all hate me anyway, um, you know, were they were there bits of were there, were there bits of stuff, bits of metal floating around in the atmosphere and short grey things waving? And why wasn't anybody waving back? It's impolite. You know, is it about that? No. Does that mean it's unimportant? No, it doesn't. Uh, but to conflate. To constantly portray our ancestors as pig ignorant, which they were not, um, and only really interested in technology, which they clearly weren't. Um, you know, and they were they were overawed the minute somebody with a bicycle turned up. No, no, no. Uh, it's it's just unfair and it's wrong, and that is a clear attack upon the religious impulse. Um, do I think, to answer what you said earlier, that there are clear enemies of Christianity in the media? Yes, I do. I agree with that. And I've heard them uh, speak. I've been in the same room where I've heard that sort of disdain mouthed and verbalised. Um, and not just as a way to annoy me. It was, it was actually meant amongst these court little groups of people. Um, you know, and, and the perceived errors of the Christian tradition, and there are so many, let's not go into it. We all know what they are. We all know uh, uh, who perpetrated them to a certain extent. You know, what's my explanation? Beyond a certain point, there isn't one, apart from the fact I keep coming back to one fundamental truth. Uh, most of our ancestors were bastards. There we are. Um, yeah. Um, and, you know, we're doing better now. And therefore, this type of speculation, if, if it's not more than that, and you and I think it is, you know, is global, this right, I've got to be careful how I say this, is global warming only the result of, of, of our maltreatment of the earth and the environment and the biosphere? And I'm not saying that's not going on. I'm absolutely certain it is. And I'm actually on one of the faves list, one of the favourites list of Extinction Rebellion. So they actually like what I'm saying if anybody wants to jump on me. I promise I'm finishing, John. But, but it's worth remembering that the Druids themselves were saying a, a couple of thousand years ago that the Earth was going to warm up because we were becoming a new sun. Just saying that. Handing back to you, John. Yes, well, you know, Hand, it's it's how you handle it, and that's that's the 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 point at which Rudolf Steiner deals so much with the history from the Akashic record, and that, that that's when when he's in this the, the reference that I was reading from the Gospel of John lecture, where he's talking about the Sophia, and he's making reference to that fact that it's that that faculty of being able to come into an enhanced relationship to your own being uh, is what he's making reference to and that is what was received uh, by the apostles of christ and and of course mary magdalene is one of the greatest amongst his apostles i mean if you look at uh, Rudolf Steiner makes reference to that the, 
the clothing that you see represented uh, is indicative of the, the, the radiance of the individual. And, and so you see that like uh, the Virgin Mary is, is depicted with the, the blue and the white, the blue of heaven, you know, and, and you look and she's the woman clothed with the sun in the, in the apocalypse with stars. And, and so there's that whole cosmic aspect uh, of the Sophia that's expressed by the Apocalypse of John and in the Gospel of John. And so when you look at it more closely, you see that in order for the things like that or uh, St. Paul's statement that ye shall be as the angels, that there's a very super sensible reality that is the scriptural basis. And, but, uh, and how... Uh, my good buddy, uh, Dr. Douglas Gabriel, as he put it, uh, just uh, just the other day, or even today even, Rudolf Steiner pointed out that if you are going to be an initiate, you must understand the entire biography of the human being, from group soul to the individual I am, that then becomes literally the image of God. And as we know, the image of God would have to be an image of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so there's not much more that you could say as far as a concise description of what we're discussing here. And so, yeah, the history is very important. You, you not only have a relationship to space, but you have a relationship to time. And we're crucified between on the cross of, of space and time. And so this is where we're dwelling. But what is that which is going to bring us above this realm of space and time into the super sensible, into the world of duration, as it was called by the Rosicrucians, which is the the spiritual world, the Dewa Chen, or as the the Tibetans would call it, Dewa Chan. Or Deva, Deva Khan, Deva Chan. It's it's pronounced variously by theosophists, and everybody tries to struggle with the Sanskrit terminology. But that's heaven, and that's that's the point at which you get at the end of the Divine Comedy of Dante, and he's led into the he's been led all the way up to to that high level by Beatrice, by Beatrice, right? She, she guides him. And who does he find there? He finds Bernard of Clairvaux, who, who shows him the rose of heaven. So you have a, there a very powerful image coming out of the Templar stream of this cosmic, almost architectural destiny, because the, the orchestration of the chakras is, is like the rose window in Chart Cathedral. It's this great revealed geometrical lattice work that, that, that is that which connects you to the cosmos itself. So it's, it's a true image of the cosmos rather than a muddied reflection. It's just like water, you know, that you have the muddiness so that the light can't work through it as effectively. And what, but what we're talking about here is, is, Christ came and he actually literally, instead of light being something that reflects on us from outside, he created in us the potential to be able to irradiate forth light ourselves. And that, that's the real path of redemption that we're talking about here. And so, happy Easter. Right, there's, <laughs> there's a lot to say to that one. Um, yeah, I'm not saying history is not important by any any stretch of the imagination. I mean, the relation, object relations of objects in space is actually very important for our survival. Uh, what I am saying is there, there's sort of an outer layer and an inner layer, and <clears throat> the mystical traditions, religions deal with the inner layer. Um, there is a crossover. I mean, I'm... 
blasted away by the fact that I didn't realize uh, islands like Mauritius in the Indian Ocean, <clears throat> that, that little paradise is actually meant to be a remnant of Lemuria. Um, and not for trivial reasons. I discovered yesterday, you know, I get used to the fact that people say, you know, this is this and that is that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it seems to be relatively established. There was a continent um, of which one of the, you know, that island is, is one of the remnants which sank. There are there are evidences like underwater uh, waterfalls. Uh, and you can actually see them from the coastline, apparently. Water going, it's underwater, but it's a waterfall. You know, it's, something's going over something that used to be a series of cliffs and mountains. Um, and the uneven territories uh, of the land around the island. You know, you can go out to sea and at certain points you can walk over the land that's there. There's something sank, it's really clear. Um, and that's interesting because, you know, my first temptation when I'm reading stuff from Blavatsky uh, and she talks about these things is to think, oh, yeah, yeah whatever, you know. Uh, I rather, I love Chubby Blavatsky, don't get me wrong, and I think she did an absolutely great job with The Secret Doctrine. I mean, it's a, the, the works of genius. People have got to stop being being dogs in the manger, a dog in the manger. They're works of genius. You know, disagree, but don't pull away from the fact they're incredibly, an incredibly well-crafted and well-researched books. Um, you know, and the fact, you know, but... <laughs> You need to be reminded of the fact that in Blavatsky's view, of, I mean, wouldn't devolution might be the wrong word. You know, when spirit is devolving into matter, when it's going into matter, uh, we, we have to recall that she does talk about a race of Lemurians. But you also we also have to recall, if you read the text slightly more carefully, I mean, they're not physical beings in the way we would understand that at all. I mean, it's part of the arc of spirit descending into matter. Therefore, there are sort of physical territories. So what time time you know timeline is she referring to? What what timescape is she referring to? You know, there are continents physically that they're interacting with and they're they are they are beings. I mean they're meant to, they're meant to be giants. Uh, I'm rather into giants as some people know. Um but they they're they're, they're not physical. Um, because Blavatsky, I don't think she ever said there were things like physical giants. She wouldn't have been that crass. Um, and of course, by the time we, we read her descriptions of Atlantis, uh, again, you know, and where was that? I mean, people are now saying it's around Antarctica. There's a tempting one, that one, um, because something clearly went on there and there are clearly remnants of a civilization. I don't mean all of the native cities that were incredible works of architecture. I don't mean that. I mean, there are culturally remnants. Every now and again, it surfaces, and more and more people are beginning to notice there was actually quite a high culture across that continent at some point, which they are remnants of. The Toltecs, the Olmecs, the Aztecs, they're all remnants of something that was before and something that was before that. That is very, very interesting. Um, and where's it all coming from and why? But we need to remember again what, what Fatty Blavatsky would have said. Um, you know, even the Atlanteans, when they when they emerge, when they sort of start their, their complete mismanagement of the biosphere, you brought it on yourselves. You know, when they, when they keep interfering with natural cycles and it all goes pear-shaped. You know, I mean, that wouldn't have happened at the beginning of the Atlantean epoch. Because, again, they weren't entirely physical in the way that we are. I mean, certainly much more than the Lemurians. Um, it's tempted to think the Lemurians couldn't have been hugged. They couldn't have been touched in any recognisable way. Certainly you could have done that, according to theosophy, with the Atlanteans during that early period, whereby they're making themselves known to history. And by the end of that period, then they're beings very much like us. Uh, taller, brighter, um, they pay their taxes, so they get they get, they get on better with each other than we do, apart from the fact they made a terrible error with the environment. Isn't that a tell? What an intriguing story that is. 
Uh, not in Plato, of course. I mean, if you look at Plato's description of the Atlanteans, I mean, you're looking at some sort of mental map of the psyche. Um, and of course, basically, the Egyptian priests in Plato's writings are making fun of the Greeks, um, that they're, they're children and they don't really understand either the esoteric philosophy or history. Uh, so that you have to bear that in mind. And, you know, what are the Egyptian priests up to and what's this map of the mind doing there? And is it only a map of the mind? Had the Atlanteans actually built a civilization that was built on a technology focused on psychic energy and activity and didn't need any of the mechanisms and machines that we have? Because if such a society and civilization ever existed, it would be swept away in the twinkling of an eye if anything went wrong with hardly any physical remnants left. What a, an intriguing and terrible thought. Uh, would we be swept away in the same way? No, there would be remnants everywhere. Our society, our history, our ambitions would be everywhere in stone, in metal, but they would have just gone, swept away. Um, but, you know, by the time you get to the Atlanteans as we think of them, whether they were on flying saucers or not, um, they're like us. They could be hugged. They could be touched. They could be given a good slap. Um, even though they're bigger and more noble, apparently, and with bigger brains and, you know, looking down to what was coming along, which was us. Uh, so I, there's no way I'm denying the external history of all these things. I'm just saying we've got to be careful not to throw out the baby with the bathwater and not to do what so many modern historians are doing, which is really only telling half of the truth. Right, you, you sort of got more and more details about less and less. So actually you're not explaining anything. Handing back to you, John. Very frequently in his lectures, Rudolf Steiner uh, makes the point, and Douglas reminded me of this in one of his recent videos, is that he, Rudolf Steiner would frequently begin his lectures because uh, on many occasions he was lecturing to people that were actually his students, not just a public lecture with people that were unfamiliar with the materials and he would begin the lecture with. And, and of course, as you know, the, the previous incarnations of the earth beginning with Saturn and then sun and then moon before earth came into being, he would say something to that effect to create the context and then go into further development but when you get to the Earth evolution proper, which is where we are now, in case nobody told you, but uh, that in our current cycle within the, the lifetime of the Earth, so to speak, that we're in the fifth great period. And so it begins with the Polarian and then the Hyperborean and then the Lemurian is the third and then the fourth is the Atlantean period, which is actually technically the center of Earth evolution. But now we're in the fifth period. But see, through this event on Easter, Christ was able to establish a new turning point in time so that the center of Earth evolution ontologically wasn't in the fourth period per se, but that it was in this fifth period at the mystery of Golgotha. And that through that, he was able to renew the spark behind earth evolution and, and enter into the earth itself so that the solar logos, the, the second, the embodiment of the second aspect of the Trinity, uh, the leader of that, in which brought our world into being, that actual being, and nothing was made that was not made by him. So that now that we're in that, we're surrounded by our higher principles. There, if you look inside, you say they always say, you know, go deep within and all that. Well, yeah, but it's not in there yet. You know, it's it's up to you to make that something an internalized capacity because until one does that one is surrounded by the higher principles just as in earlier stages 
of Earth evolution, the ego itself was was really outside of man. And I've made reference to that in uh, Moses seeing it in the burning bush, although there were initiates that had gone in advance of mankind, were able to come into an internalized relationship to that uh, divine ego, so to speak, that is the gift of Christ for all mankind, though. See, it's not just for one group, whereas the previous cultures before Christ, you have these impulses going to different peoples and uh, related to their relationship to their folk soul and their surroundings and, and their particular bloodline and all these sorts of things. So that the uniqueness of the Christ impulses that we can come into relationship with uh, a level of being that is a, a drop that has been given to all mankind from the great ocean of the Logos. And so that's where we find our true humanness. And so in finding our true humanity, it can lead us onto a path to the realization of that promise that was given to us through the resurrection. And so that is in all humility. And I can't believe that I'm the guy that's here talking about it, but you know, stranger things have happened. And, uh, but I'm totally humbled by the experience of, of thinking of these things. And I'm, I'm grateful to, to those of you that are out there that make it possible for me to, to have this sharing with you because it's something that I've spent off and on, you know, my life on, my adult life. And likewise with Reverend David, who's the author of three books, his first book is The Grammar of Witchcraft. And uh, if somebody has a right to speak of Shakespeare, it's Reverend David. And so that's his Shakespearean study. It's not a grimoire. And here you have his Shakespearean as poetry, Caliban's Redemption. And his third volume is Mount Athos, Inside Me, Essays on Religion, Swedenborg and the Arts, edited by the talented Daniela Erendust. And those are all available on Amazon. And I recommend you examine their contents. And as for myself, I have just two books. I haven't caught up to David yet. The Arcana of the Grail Angel is my first book, and that's the spiritual science of the Holy Blood and of the Holy Grail, a study developed out of the work of Rudolf Steiner of the underground streams of esoteric Christianity, which flowed from the Brotherhood of the Holy Grail to the Order of the Knights Templar and the True Rosicrucian Order. And that's some 640 pages with a great many diagrams based on the diagrams that were handwritten by Aaron Pfeiffer that went across my desk many years ago. And uh, in my second volume, uh, Arcana of Light on the Path, I further try to elaborate that uh, star wisdom, astrosophia. And in there is related the all of the diagrams that are in the first book. And I created a great many more to extend the journey further. And so those books would be very helpful for anybody that's trying to figure out what we're talking about here. And it's a, a great honor to have those available to you still, although I'm running low on Arcana of the Grail Angel, the first book, but they're available through eBay directly from me, or you, if you're outside, the continental US, you can contact me through the academia link listed below, and uh, I can make arrangements to get them to you outside the country. You can also, if you're outside the country, private message me on Facebook and make reference to it, and I can work it out through either one of those avenues via PayPal. And also, uh, if anybody's interested in sharing a cup of coffee, or no amounts too small, 
paypal.me forward slash d perry 777 for reverend david and paypal.me forward slash john barnwell 888 and uh, that's greatly appreciated and i need to uh and of course this podcast has been made possible by the generous support of tyla vadim vivian neo christian mark ma Druvman, laura paula rick michael beth anil fred and so many others over the years and i want to thank you all for supporting our humble efforts and so i think i thought of everything didn't i oh yeah hit like and subscribe to my channel that's very helpful too so where were we I believe we're at the joy and miracle of Easter. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's it, it, it saddens me a great deal uh, when people speak of Christianity as sort of a tribal undertaking, you know, sort of Europeans or Americans or my village or my little township and we're right and everyone else is wrong. And that's within Christianity, let alone getting outside Christianity, outside Christendom. Um, yeah, I mean, in, in you know, in theosophical stroke, anthroposophical terms, the arc is now evolving again. Spirit is going upwards after having achieved achieved the glorious goal of, of Christ Jesus and His ministry. Um, it makes me very, very, very sad that people are determined to put these mysteries of mysteries uh, into such small frames of reference. Um, you know, my God's bigger than your God. My my view of Scripture is bigger than your view of Scripture. Or mine's, you know, and what's that old chestnut? You know, don't go through the wide gate. But no, don't worry, none of you do. All of you little bigots, you're all at the wide gate. None of you go through the narrow gate. You're all there because you're all little bigots. Um, that's the wide gate, not the narrow one. Uh, if there's no love in your life, then remember, I can't remember, was it the Confessor Maximus? Uh, theology without love is the theology of demons. And I really wish people would remember that a bit more. Um, you know, what have you done recently to show you're a Christian? You know, I'm a Christian and I, 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 I love Jesus and I have Jesus coloring books. That's based on a real example. Uh, you know, well, Jesus didn't say get christian coloring books he said feed the poor have you done that recently you know so it really for me it's a terrible shame when people reduce 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 and belittle their own faith which has cosmic implications i mean i know you don't like teilhard de chardin and i i know in certain ways he's a problematic character uh, but every time that type of discussion of Christian truth um, is aired, I actually feel inspired and enlightened. I mean, he's attacked on the one side by materialist paleontologists who simply will never, ever, ever put... <sighs> Let's keep to the level of, of thought. They will never put thoughts, concepts of meaning and value into their analyses of the facts around them facts so-called um but how can that be accurate if you're losing if you're losing th things like evolutionary creativity without which species die out if you're not talking about the fact human beings uh, as a species tend to be driven by the search for personal meaning and look what happens when they don't find it or it's removed i mean i'm thinking of maybe um the example, yeah, you know, when the conquistadors arrived and fought with Atahualpa, uh, and when the emperor was finally unmasked as their their as their victim and their prisoner, um, I mean, very shortly after that entire civilization collapsed because its raison d'être, its its meaning had been lost. I mean, isn't that what the Native Americans keep saying on their reserves? that that is the thing that's lost. That's the thing that's gone. And unless that returns, they won't have a sense of personal worth and value. I mean, therefore, if any scientific enterprise is leaving those 
so-called subjectivities out of their analyses, they will never arrive at a truth. They will never arrive as, you know, at a phenomena, at a description of a phenomena that they're meant to be arriving at, which is why I, I like Teilhard. Um, on the other side, you've got the theologists, uh, theologians in Catholic cases, um, who are saying it's not that, I'll just finish with this bit, John. It, it's not the Christ of the Gospels. But how? How is, not the, how is that not the Christ of the Gospels? Handing back, John. Well, I never said that that T.R. de Chardin wasn't smart. He's he's actually a good example of of that uh, material intellect attempting to grapple with sensory data, you know. And but he also has a checkered career and his involvement in helping uh, Mao Zedong come to power in China and uh, the whole Je all the Jesuits machinations that he was involved in and and to get into understanding all of that and you get into the history of Christianity and warfare and, you know uh, look at uh, Christina of Sweden Queen Christina of Sweden she ends up uh, cutting a deal where she can go to Italy and just be the way she wants to be and th this deal was brokered through her relationship with a Jesuit uh, confessor. And so they were willing to, to make a bargain with her so that uh, they could gain the power of, of having control over her. And so she abdicated from the throne of Sweden and moved to Italy. And so for, for certain personal freedoms that she wanted to achieve. And she was, by the way, one of the, if perhaps the most educated female uh, royal uh, that you're going to find in examination of history, you know? So she was very much uh, in the know, as they say. It's just, again, these things become interesting in the light of history and we have to, uh, develop the capacity to, to contextualize according to the evolutionary stage that's involved and in, in making that transition coming out of the intellectual soul into the consciousness soul is a real riddle and we're not really that far into it. So uh, we have to give people a little bit of latitude. But yes, uh, uh, Descartes, yeah, she, he he went and hung out with her and was kind of her mentor, Rene Descartes, and he was a controversial figure at least. But his, it's interesting that he was able; he was the one who really the first one to point out the importance of the pineal gland. Of course, his his description of exactly what process was involved was rather crude, but nonetheless, he pointed at the uh, pineal gland he, he referred to it as being the seat of the soul and that but that very much ties into occult physiology physiology but it, after another manner but in any regards yes she was brilliant and so you have this and you have this struggle of the development of 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 the intellect but it's the shadow intellect it's 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 not the the kind of intellect that an angel would have so to speak that angels don't have to go through this whole linearity uh, to arrive at their ideas that they can enter into an idea with a relationship to the truth of its existence and so that's to be able to think like an angel which essentially is a good description of of developing the manas or spirit self that one comes into that but that brings one into a relationship with others that are are dwelling within that a level of truth and wisdom see so that things are true because they are true not because you're you're compelled to be uh, a future group soul and uh, an egregore you know, to come into that loss of individuality. 
it's an enhancement of individuality to be able to evolve into spirits of freedom and love and and come into a relationship to with mathematical certainty that certain things have a moral uh, equivalence. And so that you have to remember when Ritter Steiner says imagination, inspiration, and intuition, he really uh, is meaning moral imagination, moral inspiration, and moral intuition. Yeah, I remember reading the meditations of Descartes years back and feeling genuinely like I'd learned something, uh, sort of it. I know we're getting close to that time. Oh gosh, what a terrible thought. I'm really sorry to hear that. Um, you know, I mean, what, you know, a soldier approaching philosophical problems as a soldier, you know, this is the problem. How do we get to a solution of that problem? Um, I suppose because of my ilk, I'm not a soldier. I always prefer Tubby Aquinas, the angelic doctor, who, of course, is one of the dancers uh, in heaven, according to Dante. Um, you know, he, he's literally been glorified into being one of the people so overcome with glory. He's been raised up. It seems to people viewing him from their position in time and space that he's like a dancer, John, my friend. Well, you know, there are those stories of, of that, uh, say, Thomas Aquinas, Dr. Angelicus, that that he had to be withheld from, from performing the Eucharist because he would he would get so enwrapped into it that he would levitate. I suppose this is where I lose all credibility. I actually believe such things are possible um, because I am interested in the paranormal and also interested in the supernatural and the, they're not the same thing and they're not entirely negative. Um, John? I have a friend and I, I won't name her, her name, but she went into a consciousness uh, enhancement state. And when she caught herself, she looked down and she was about a foot off the ground. <laughs> you know, and that's quite a, quite a profound experience. And, uh, you know, I, I believe her, you know, it's, it's again, uh, Valentin Tomberg gets in description about how there's two different ways in which that can happen. One is is demonic in 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 the bad sense, and there's that famous photograph of those women on the wall, about several feet off the ground, you know, just their faces at the wall, and demonically possessed. To the story like Aquinas, where through his relationship to the levity of the spiritual world, was lifted up. And so there's a great difference. And so, again, some people would struggle with that. And okay, then that's their job to struggle with that at the current time. And so I think that uh, it'd be great if we could get Reverend David to, to lead us in a, in a consecration, in an in a Easter prayer. My friends, um, I don't have anything to say after all of that. I mean, it's Easter. It's Easter Sunday. Um, it's a pleasure being with my friend John again, because the week just isn't the same unless this is crowning it. Um, it's a pleasure to be with all our viewers and listeners again, because uh, I love our little community. I love our little family very much. Um, and I love Easter. I love the bunnies. I love the chocolate eggs. I love the painted eggs. I like the laid tables. Uh, I love all of it because it's a celebration of life. You know, we, we have an audacious thought in Christianity, an audacious perception that through the ministry, through the life of one man who was murdered by the people around him, that life came out of death. That is an astonishing statement, thought, an overpowering claim. So what would I like to do? I'd like to wish all of you an Easter of the heart, an Easter of the mind, an Easter of the mouth, an Easter, an Easter of the soul, and an Easter of your entire lives in the week ahead. May rebirth, joy, wonder, and beauty 
be with you all until we meet again. Amen. Amen. And thank you very much. And thank you, everybody, for showing up. And for those of you that see us later on, happy Easter to you from both of us.